Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining me this evening. Welcome to the Wine Access Experience on Facebook. Uh, my name is Vanessa Conlon. I'm the head of wine for Wine Access, and I'm so excited to be here this evening with Armin Kachaturian, Director of Sales for Claude Duval, but also a very good friend of mine. So it's really great not only to, um, to talk about wine, but to see your face, and even though we're virtual, uh, I'm going to pretend of different wines we're going to taste tonight. Um, I'm really excited about the first one. I'm not going to tell you what it is just yet. I'm going to give folks just a minute to jump on from home, but um, it's from the 90s, which is a, a real treat. I happen to have already poured myself a little taste of it because I couldn't wait. <laughs> I'm so excited to taste it with you uh, and for you to tell us all about it. But um, anyone uh, at home, if you're just joining us, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I'm Vanessa, head of Wine for Wine Access, here with Armin Kaksaturian, Director of Sales for Claude Duval. Um, and we'd love for you to participate as much as possible from home. So certainly if you have any questions that you'd like um, Armin to answer, please type them in the chat and we will answer uh, as many questions as we can in the next 30 minutes. So, okay, well, Armin, uh, there's so much to talk about with yes. Claude Duval, but I, I really just kind of want to dive into what I feel like has to be one of the most, if not the absolute most important thing that ever happened to Claude Duval Winery, which is being part of the judgment of Paris. So um, now, obviously, neither of us were like even born. Um, but can you tell, can you tell uh, for folks at home, what kind of an impact did that have on the winery at that time, and how has that affected its evolution over time? I mean, you know, it was huge. 1972, first vintage at Claude Duval. Uh, Bernard Porte, uh, founding winemaker, uh, Gallet family, they set their roots in Napa Valley. Not much was going on here. They referred to the class of 72, all the wineries that popped up in uh, 1972, we were one of them. And to have that first vintage four years later be in the Judgment of Paris tasting, not only changed Napa Valley, but it changed Cote of All because people took notice. Uh, there was also a lot less competition back then. So Cote of All was really able to stand out. They also, uh, the fruit from that 72 vintage came from the vineyards right in front of us um, that we call here in Del Vineyard today, Stagsic District. At the time it was just Napa Valley. And uh, those vineyards have been part of this winery story since then. And so, um, speaking of Stag Group, and then I think we should dive into some wine here, but um, can you tell me what is it about Stag's Leap that's distinctive? And how would you describe um, a, what Stag's Leap ABA brings to Cabernet in the glass? So Stag's Leap's really interesting. It was the fourth ABA in 1989 in Napa Valley, but it's also the smallest to this day. It's about three miles long, one mile wide. Uh, you have around 1,200 acres planted, so there's just a finite amount, amount of wine you can get. But it's also the uh, first AVA, or the only AVA that has an elevation cap. You can't be over 400 foot elevation and still be in the Sagsic District. So uh, they started discussing the, the AVA in 87. It took about two years of redrawing the line, redrawing the line until, you know, I mean, Silverado, the original drawing had Silverado's vineyard cut in half. Half of it was Sagsic District, the other half was not. And so they looked and they finally uh, set the borders and finalized it in 89. It has this velvety texture to it. And uh, it's really distinct, very distinct. Well, let's, um, let's give this a pour. So I, um, I decanted this wine. So for folks at home, this is um, the 1992 vintage of uh, Cote d'Ivoire Stag's Leap Cabernet Sauvignon. So I decanted mine um, about probably 45 minutes ago, just really for sediment. Um, I wasn't sure with this wine, you know, sometimes with an older wine, decanting it too soon, sometimes the wine starts to fade before you've really had a chance to 
to get in there. So I didn't want to do it too soon. It did throw some sediment, but um, just this little bit that I've had in my glass so far, it's amazingly, amazingly fresh. And there's still so much fruit to this wine. Um, so 1992, uh, refresh my memory. What was going on in Napa Valley and what was going on at Cordoval? So, you know, Napa Valley is interesting. Uh, it was still people were poning up to bars for tasting. People were really doing the tasting experience. You, if, they, if a winery charged you anything, they would charge you $5 and you got to keep a logo glass and t took it home with you back to wherever you went. So Napa Valley was really different than that back then. But in terms of harvest, uh, it was uh, a lot of people described it as a really, really incredible harvest. Uh, early bud break, really hot summer, and then it cooled down August, September, um, and the fruit was just spectacular. Interesting thing about this vintage, so our uh, estate vineyards here, we have about 125 acres planted in Sagsic District. These vineyards uh, were replanted after the 92 harvest, so this is the last wine from that vineyard until it was replanted, obviously due to phylloxera. So they replanted the entire 125 acre uh, vineyard in one shot. Um, so this was kind of like the last of the original plantings from the 70s, so it's really special. Uh, final blend on this was 83 Cab, 9 Cab Franc, and 8% Merlot. Uh, so it's, it is a Cabernet, obviously over 75%, but Bernard uh, Porte being you know, a French winemaker, he grew up at Chateau Lafitte, he was always about the Bordeaux blends, so. So you, you mentioned something I actually wanted to ask you about, which is um, replanting because of uh, phylloxera. So I know that obviously that was a, you know, like a, an unmitigated disaster for Napa Valley, um, but the replanting that happened after did allow people to improve their their vineyard um, their vineyard structure and and do some corrections there. So did you change anything with that opportunity in terms of the vineyard? Um, they chose some different clones, but they also changed what they planted. There used to be more Merlot planted. There used to be Zinfandel planted. There was um, uh, uh, more, uh, or there was less Cab Franc planted. So they planted more Cabernet Sauvignon. They planted more Cabernet Franc and really kind of changed the landscape. But what's funny is the replantings are still going on. Uh, two years ago, there was a 100 acre Sauvignon Blanc vineyard that was ripped out. That is being planted to Cabernet uh, and Merlot and Cab Franc. But uh, the, the change in what was planted, I mean, I've seen bottlings of uh, Stags Leap District Zinfandel, which is really funny. Um, uh, so it's, it's going really to uh, shifting over to Bordeaux was a big, big difference. So um, I mentioned, you know, that I did, I did de decant um, the bottle that I have here for sediment, but how do you recommend um, a, drinking a vintage with this type of age on it? What do you do? So my, my first job, I uh, worked at Hansel Vineyards and Jean Arnold Sessions was one of my best uh, mentors to this day. And she, was all, she always talked about the art of decanting. I know on the flip side, Fred Dame hates decanting. So, you know, everyone has their own opinion. Personally, I'm a huge fan of decanting. Uh, I think older wines, decanting, especially for the sediment is really important. Um, some people don't mind the sediment. I like the wine to be a little bit cleaner. Uh, mm -hmm. and I don't want to sit there for four hours on bottle number one. I'd like to have it open up and and uh, enjoy it, you know, within a 45 minute hour time frame and move on to the next bottle. And with the older vintages, what do you like to pair with it? Uh, meat. Uh, lots of meat. Um, uh, but they also go great with like, you know, earthy mushrooms and, yeah. um, uh, you know, root vegetables too so it's not limited to just uh, meat but uh, game uh, gaming meat does really well with it as well uh, it's versatile it's the, the cabernets from the 90s they're not these huge um, over the top i mean they have five to seven days of, of uh, uh, extended maceration you know so they, they didn't sit you know there for for th uh, 30 days the, the wines were just built differently back then yeah. Well, it's, it's remarkably elegant, um, and I said it, it has a, a really impressive amount of fruit still on it, um, uh, in addition to the sort of mushroomy umami notes that you're, that you're mentioning um, because of the, uh, the maturity of the wine, but 
I'm really, really impressed with this. It's it's outstanding. So thank you for thank you for sharing this. So speaking of, of younger wines then, and also of um, decanting. So I also have the 2016 Estate uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, which is one of our favorites at Wine Access. This is in our store right now for $45. Um, great vintage. Now on a wine like this, you know, we, we talked about decanting the older wines for sediment, but do you like to decant the younger wines for aeration as well? Definitely. Um, it's funny, you know, Back in the days when we used to go out to restaurants, the good old days, uh, every time we'd order a bottle, we'd always ask for it to get decanted. And, um, you know, it's it's trying to take the genie out of the bottle. It needs to breathe. Uh, with all current vintage wines, uh, even Chardonnays, I like to decant. But once again, I like I like the wine to be consumed uh, in, in, a, in a timely manner. Usually, you know, my ideal dinner is you know, four to eight friends around a table, multiple courses, multiple bottles of wine, and just kind of, you know, ex uh, experiencing the wine with food and with friends. And you can come back to it, but it's kind of nice to, to kind of go through the wines and, and not have to sit there for four hours. So um, we've talked about this um, at various times about the decision that Clodeval made in the last, you'll have to remind me what year it was to move to all estate fruit. Um, so for yeah. folks at home, can you kind of explain what that means and why you would choose to do that? And then what you think the result is in terms of um, what we're seeing in the glass these days? So Clodeval, I mean, we, we've been around for uh, 48 years now and that's, that's a, a long time for California standards, right? For new world standards. And uh, over the years, the winery started to grow and after the replanting um, in 92, after the 92 harvest, they got in the business of buying fruit because obviously their vineyards were all you know, newly planted. So when the vines came back online about four or five years later, people were trying to pay a premium for Stag's Eat District. And the winery realized that they can sell fruit at a premium from Stag's Eat District and buy fruit from Napa Valley at a little bit lower price and increase their production. And uh, there was a time where the quality of fruit was great but over the years, it's harder and harder to control that, that quality. So the winery, starting with the 2014 vintage on the Cabernet, uh, decided to shift everything to an estate model. And an estate model basically means you grow it, you make it. You don't buy any fruit from anyone. And that was a big deal because it took our production from 90,000 cases down to 30, 35,000 cases. Um, and it depends on vintage. Some vintages are lower than others because if you have a, a tough vintage uh, and you get lower yields, you can't buy fruit from anyone. Uh, not if you want to be a state. But it really gave us the ability to control what we do in the vineyards and ultimately what we do in the bottle. So that was, uh, that was a big thing. Now the other part of it was we started controlling our farming methods. And we went from you know, conventional sustainable farming to organic farming. And we were hoping that in the next few months, we'll get our certificate, a certificate from CCOF um, that will be certified organic. Um, but we have been farming for organic for over four years now, with John Mark Chapelet uh, taking the lead on that, uh, working with Ted Henry, our winemaker. So, um, I mean, I'm a big fan of, of organic farming. Um, I used to work for, you know, uh, Donna Estates, which is all certified organically farmed. And um, I know, you know, sort of my answer to this question when people would ask me, um, which I'm happy to answer after I put you on the spot, but in terms of the organic farming, what do you, do you think that the quality of the wine has improved since you started um, from your organic food? I, I definitely do. I mean, the quality of wines we're making today are far superior than what we've made in the past. Um, that being said, I wasn't here when the wines were released uh, in the 2000s, uh, late, you know, early, like 2010, 11, 12, I was here when the wines were released, but I'm tasting these wines, not only um, are they drinking phenomenally well, but they keep getting better and better every year. Uh, I think with organic farming, we're spending so much time uh, in the vineyard, we're really connecting with the vine, and uh, our yields are a lot lower. Um, but I think, you know, organic farming is, is our future, at least. I don't dictate what people should do, but um, w for us, it's, you know, we're doing it because it's our philosophy. We want the, to give to the land what we're going to get back. 
and make sure it's going to be there for the next generation because currently we're a third generation Gallet family ownership and that's that's kind of a big deal i mean uh the the generational things in napa valley generation one started it generation two a lot of times doesn't want to work and and kill themselves like generation one did uh and and i think the key is if you can get to generation three uh there's 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 this connection we have with generation one our grandparents right and uh it, it they want to continue it and currently generation four we have uh two two kids at generation four that are uh about a year and year and a half old so we got to keep it for them for the next you know 25 years until they, they come of age yeah it is getting more and more rare to see that generational transition um happening successfully anyway um one more question about organics before we move on um but do you find that your uh, consumers uh, react more favorably to the wine? Like, are they interested in knowing whether it's organic and does that influence their buying decisions? Um, I think it does for some. Uh, now, as I said, it's our philosophy to do it, so we don't put it on the label. Um, but it's, it's been part of our philosophy. And, and, you know, for the customers that care, they really care. And if, for the customers that don't, it, for them, it's just a great bottle of wine. And nothing wrong with that. Everyone has the things that they care about, but uh, this way we get to appease more, more of our customers. Got it. And one, one last question, then I'll stop asking you about this sub topic. I promise. But is there any difference in terms of um, how the uh, uh, when you switched to organic farming, how it was perceived by sommeliers, for instance, versus like you know your direct to to consumer clients, or was it pretty equal across the two types? Um, I think trade is, is uh, uh, more interested in it because it gives them a part of the story they get to go tell. So with sommeliers, it's, it's, it's another piece of the story. Not only are they family owned, not only have they been around for 40 some odd years, they're also farmed organically. So it gives them another piece of that story to share. Yeah. Great. Well, yeah. I'm dying to move on also to um, this third bottle, which I'm going to which is um, the 2015 uh, Stags District Cabernet Sauvignon the Hirondel uh, Vineyard. So I understand this is a um, pretty special vineyard. Can you tell us why? So this is the same vineyard that we have been using since the 70s. And uh, the, the vines now at 2015, uh, they're, they're, the age of the vines have kind of come back to what they were in the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, so we're looking at, you know, 20, 26, 25 year old vines. And uh, they're really starting to, to, to shine, I think. So um, I think it's fair to say that the winemaking style of, of Cote d'Ivoire has always been informed this by Bordeaux in terms of a more sort of balance and elegance. Um, so what do you actually do to achieve this? So what's interesting is uh, the wine, the first two wines we tasted, the 92 SLD, uh, that was a, a you know, 83% Cabernet. The uh, 2016 Cabernet is only 75% Cabernet. And then um, it has some Petit Verdot, Merlot, and Cab Franc. What's interesting about the Hering, though, is it's 100% Cabernet. And uh, Ted Henry, our winemaker, um, you know, when we there, he was tasting through the blocks, he realized that that Hirondale Vineyard, a few of the blocks on there are so spectacular that he can make a Cabernet that's 100%. And Bernard uh, is, is here all the time. He's tasting with Ted. Um, and he, after tasting the wine, he gave him his blessing. He's like, you know, you, you've done something pretty phenomenal uh, with, with uh, the, the vineyard here and with the Cabernet being 100%. So Hirondel is 100% Cabernet and always will be. And that's a bit harder too, right? Too because you don't have your sort of other spices you can throw in the mix in terms of other varieties, right? Yeah, you, you're limited by that. But uh, if, uh, if you can get the quality of fruit to, to be what it is here in this little block of vineyards, um, what's interesting is so I have 125 acres uh two or three blocks uh that butt up against slv vineyard uh, near fay vineyard that's where we get the cabernet for the herringdale from and uh it's it's a pretty pretty historic vineyard i mean when you look at historically 1961 nathaniel fay plants cabernet 
uh, about a mile and a quarter up the road from us. And uh, when he planted Cabernet, there were 800 acres of Cabernet in, all, in the entire United States. The wines that he made from those vineyards changed the minds of so many people, including Robert Mondavi and Warren Lenarski. Um, so I think there's something special about that site. And for, for our Cabernet to be that close to it, uh, I just think it, it, it feeds off of that, that little uh, uh, God-kissed uh, uh, soil. And the quality of Cabernet is just phenomenal. Right. So, um, obviously, there's a, a long history with Stephen Spurrier, uh, given the, the judgment of Paris. But I understand that he uh, he still shows up at the winery sometimes. So he does. Um, <laughs> uh, I actually just went to him in Toronto. Uh, in fact, the last week I was on the road, uh, I was in Toronto, and, and Stephen Spurrier was there pouring uh, his uh, uh, sparkling wine from that he makes uh, from his vineyards in the UK. And uh, it, was, it was nice to see him. We had dinner with him in November. Um, he's been a friend of the winery. Uh, in fact, after the Psalm 3 movie, uh, uh, to honor Stephen and what he has done for Napa Valley, we renamed the road that comes into Clodeval as Stephen Spurrier Lane. So he finally got a street named after him. Um, nice. So, um, so then, you mentioned that there's um, three generations uh, family family owned winery there. So can you tell me um, and you know, maybe you shouldn't let them listen to this. So this will be just between the two of us. But what's that like? What are uh, what's what are the challenges? And you know, and, and what do you think are the benefits of, of having family ownership? Um, you know, I mean, challenges are the fact that you have multiple family members and everyone has an input and they might not always be the same input. But you have to, you know, work together uh, to kind of come to a solution. But it's kind of nice to work for a family and, and not a, a corporation that you don't know who they are, right? Uh, so, in fact, uh, Mr. Gillette, John Gillette, Generation One, comes here, uh, you know, a couple times a year. And uh, last time he was here, he found out that I was going to be in uh, France and they have a, a house outside of Paris. And they invited us over to the house for lunch. And you, you kind of lose that when you're not a family. And it's kind of nice um, uh, to have that. Uh, I've spent a lot of time with Generation 3. Uh, and they are here running day to day. Obviously, Generation 1 and 2 are still involved. Um, but my, personally, my interactions have been great. A lot of family-owned wineries. I've worked for family-owned wineries my entire life. And, you know, they have their, their, their challenges, um, but the benefits, I think, uh, far outweigh those challenges, that you get to work with people who you know who they are. And uh, in difficult times like, like we're going through right now, it's nice to have that family that, that cares uh, about people and the winery and not just looking at a spreadsheet and looking at the bottom line. Um, so that part of it's kind of nice. Got it. So. So I have a question. Um, Cordoba is so historic. Obviously, we talked about you know, the judgment of Paris. It's it's not the new kid on the block, though. So no. when you when you look at how many wineries have sprung up in the meantime, you know how many people are making you know very expensive Napa Cabernets and really high quality Napa Cabernets. How how does Cordoba stay relevant? Um. You know, that's an interesting question. There's a lot of different aspects to it. First of all, um, you have to evolve and change, right? So you need to look at your customer um, and, and try to give them as much of what they're looking for. One thing they're looking for is, is loyalty. They want to make sure that the, the winery that they're working with is going to be loyal to them as well. It's not just the customer being loyal to us. Um, also, changing with the times. I mean, when we shifted over to organic farming, we made a lot of friends that way. Uh, I think there's also something uh, uh, exciting about the old school coming back. Uh, and, you know, Claude Ball has stayed relevant all these years by trying to do all the right things. Uh, taking care of the land, taking care of the people, and, uh, you know, still being family owned. I think people really appreciate that uh, because they get to, to, to support people, right? And corporations are people too but they want to know who it is that they're supporting. Um, 
You know, I mean, we're, we're, we're a small business. We're a small family-owned business. And, uh, uh, you know, in the big scheme of things, our entire production is a lot less than uh, quite a few blue chips in Napa Valley. So. So going back to this sort of um, Bordeaux Napa comparison, you know, are there things that you think that um, that Bordeaux is doing to emulate either the styles or the strategy of Napa these days? You know, it's funny you say that. I, I think so. I always say, uh, you know, California has found has found a way to change and manipulate every varietal out there. Um, and uh, they ended up going back. You know, they, they had the big OP buttery Chardonnay when they started going back. They had the Zins that were like 17, 18% alcohol they started going back. Uh, but I think what they've done with Cabernet is uh, they, they've kept true to what they want to do. They haven't gone over the top. And Bordeaux has changed and said, okay, maybe we need to make our wines a little bit more approachable today and not something that you need to lay down for 20, 30, 40 years. Um, or longer, right? I've had some Bordeaux from the, the early 1900s that are still drinking. Um, but I think I think Bordeaux has looked and said, okay, what are they doing and how are they doing it? I think and I think the Judgment of Paris was, was a big uh, wake-up call because they had to look and say, okay, maybe we need to modernize a little bit. And um, uh, they probably made some changes in the vineyards. Uh, they obviously made changes in winemaking. Um, and also when it comes to winemaking, science has made uh, has has allowed us to make so many changes and being new and young i think and not being stuck to tradition i think napa valley uh, you know welcomed the scientific uh, changes and and, and the winemaking in a lab where you can look at ph levels and you can look at different types of fermentation and different types of yeast and figure out why is this different than that instead of just saying well traditionally we've done it this way um you know the first winery i worked for was hansel vineyards and out in Sonoma, Chard and Pinot. And one thing that Hansel has is uh, the, the jack of the stainless steel tank that every winery has was designed and invented there in the 50s. Well, Brion was second to follow. So when you think about jack of the stainless steel tanks only being around as, as winemaking, uh, as part of winemaking uh, since the 50s, what did they do before then, right? And how has that changed it? So I have another question. Uh, so some people say that Napa wines can't age. Now I have this 1992 in my glass that proves that that's completely yeah. false. Why do you think that is? Why, why is there this perception about Napa not being able to age as well as other regions like Bordeaux? Okay, so first of all, the question about ageability is the funniest thing because when you look at statistics, 96% of wine is consumed in the first 24 hours is purchased, right? So the people who talk about, I want to age my wine, well, no, you really don't. You want to drink it as soon as you get home. But let's put that aside and say, okay, if you want to, if you talk about ageability, um, it comes down to what wine profile do you like? Do you like wines uh, with, with more of that earthiness and that forest floor? Um, or do you like wines with fresh fruit? Because the 92 has fruit, but it's not the same fruit as the 16 Estate Cabernet. Um, so it, it becomes more of a, of a taste profile thing. What is it you like? So I had a 63, or sorry, a 64 Ingle Nook Estate Cabernet with a song uh, from the UK who was Italian who didn't think California knew how to make great wines. And that wine changed his mind. Now, um, there's something to be said about old Ingle Nook, right? And there's something to be said about wine making in the 60s versus today, but um, I don't know if it makes any sense. I don't, it's, it's, it's an interesting concept. Wines can age, but do you like them when they're aged? Because you can get 10 people in a room and you're gonna get 10 different opinions on how a wine is drinking that's 30 years old. Someone's gonna say it's past its prime. Someone's gonna say it needs another 20 years. So it all comes down to personal preference. Yeah, I have a, I have a former boss, you can probably think of who it is, who has a, a very nice collection and no matter how old it was, uh, every time he'd say, ah, it's too young. Uh, so I think exactly true. <laughs> His, I, I, I like wine, that I like Napa Cabernets with some maturity on them, but um, but yeah, it's a question of, you know, what's, what's your preference? How do you like to enjoy the wines? 
Um, so I think we covered this in our answer, but just so we don't ignore it, we did have a question from home from Alan, who wants to know what is it about organic farming that enhances the quality of the wine? You know, I think I think to break it down, it basically comes down to controlling your ingredients, right? Um, if you control uh, with organic farming, you really spend the time in the vineyard to touch the fruit, touch the vines. Uh, a lot of it's done by hand, and um, you know, you can't make great wine with not, you know, mediocre grapes. So it all starts out in the vineyard. And if you can get that first part done um, with all the technologies we have today with optical sorters and uh, tanks that have uh, 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 the, 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 that you can monitor with an app, uh, the rest of that part becomes a little bit easier. Um, but it, it, to me, it all starts in the vineyard. So if the quality of the grapes is as best as it can be, then then it's a pretty pretty damn good start. And with organic farming, you're you're, you're forced to spend so much more time in the vineyards because you have to see what's going on. Um, you know, I always say that the, the, as a joke, what's the difference between certified organic farming and organic farming? One day, right? It's the one day when you're like, oh, I should go spray. Um, but if you're certified, you can't. So. Um. So. Uh. I'm almost done torturing you because uh, we're almost out of time, but I'm having so much fun. I have to ask at least one more question, at least, um, which is which is kind of broad. But you, you know, you guys are, as I mentioned, you're you're, you're an iconic winery, Napa Valley. There's so much history behind you. So, like, what's next? What's the next chapter for Clodeval? You know, I think the next chapter for Clodeval is really getting the next generation uh, to understand who we are, what we do, and help tell our story. Because at the end of the day, you have a lot of wineries and a lot of great wines, but it's really the stories that set these wineries apart. If we want to be able to get to generation four, five, and six, we're going to need uh, people to hear our story. We're going to need people to tell our story. And uh, we're, because stories help the bottle of wine get in someone's glass. I mean, I can talk about this wine all day long, but until it's in your glass and you're tasting it, it's not going to mean anything. So. Um, it's really trying to trying to make that connection. So if our story is told and our story is heard, and people want to taste our wines, then they'll have that emotional connection. And then when they do, then it's a lifelong relationship that you know hopefully is enjoyable for all parties involved. Wow! Well, um, it's been such a pleasure uh, to have you join me, and we're, this is not the last time I will see you here because no. you're going to come back in. Uh, couple weeks right and we're going to talk about something that fascinates me which is uh armenian wines yes. so i hope everyone comes back for that i'm certainly going to be full of questions and very excited to taste those it's not a category i could say uh i'm you know it's, that i taste all the time or really ever so um but i should and i know that people will be very excited once once they start and i'm really excited to uh, to talk about them with you and just Absolutely. bring people's awareness to to what's happening um, so one one story I wanted to share with you though is about Stephen Spurrier's. I remember this is probably I don't know seven years ago or something, but I was at the Naples Winter Wine Festival uh, and the after party, and I have to tell you, Stephen Spurrier is a hell of a dancer because he was just cutting a rug all by all by himself. Um, and I really actually regret not dancing with him to this day. I regret that because it was impressive. It was quite a show. Um, but maybe, maybe I'll have another chance. So, anyway. Well, if, if you come back in town, uh, we'll, we'll put on some uh, some uh, groovy tunes and you guys can, can uh, tear it up on the dance floor. Deal. <laughs> I'm going to hold you to that. <laughs> well, thank you again, Aaron, so much thank for joining you. us. Uh, anyone you. watching at home, we do have the, uh, the 2016 uh, Cabernet available on the website. Um, beautiful wine. I was so excited to try it. Um, and thank you so much, everyone, for joining us at home on the Wine Access Experience. And we'll be back soon. Anyway, in the meantime, Aaron, cheers. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Bye.